Sudden death follows the title's direction, keeling over before the game even begins. I never realized how many ways there are to kill people in a kitchen. Even ardent fans of the genre will find it hard to stay interested. Wouldn't as ever Van Damme is no Bruce Willis. Unfunny main bad guy Powers Booth is no Alan Rickman. And uninspired director Peter Hyams is no John McTiernan. Van Damme makes good, bad movies. This is not one of them. Far too sadistic. Welcome to this week's episode of Slept On Cinema. I'm your host, Stan Steamer. And I'm Grove Street. And this week we're getting into the 1995 action classic, Sudden Death, starring Jean-Claude Van Damme. And this movie kicks ass. Yeah, this movie is uh, bonkers. It has everything all the time. <laughs> all the time. It does feel like someone was, was creating this film and like, we need to give people everything. And then someone else was like, no, no, no. We need to give people everything and then even more on top of that. Because it, it literally <laughs> has everything you could possibly want and then a little bit extra. It's a, a lot of these like action movies with Van Damme and Schwarzenegger and Stallone. You can kind of pay attention and check your phone here and there. But this is not one of those movies. Be glued to the screen for this one. Because if you look away, you're going to miss something amazing. Yeah. If you want to be on your phone, just prepare to watch this movie 10 times. <laughs> so you can see yeah. It's a good excuse to get to watch this 10 times, I guess. <laughs> Shocking that this film qualifies, but uh, as always, all the films that we review on this podcast are rated at or below 50% on Rotten Tomatoes for both critics and audiences. And the podcast is structured such that the first half is spoiler free. Talk about some things to look for in the film, take a break, come back and talk about some things that we just saw. And this movie barely qualifies. Uh, we were lucky enough to just fit it in. Uh, the rotten premise. Ex-fireman Darren McCord has a new job working security at the Pittsburgh Civic Arena. Hoping to impress his kids, he scored tickets to the Stanley Cup Finals, unaware that the place had been taken over by a group of terrorists. Ex-CIA agent Joshua Foss is holding the vice president hostage in a press box and plans to blow up the building if he doesn't pay the ransom. But when Darren learns of his scheme, he jumps into action to save the day. Critics at 50%, audience slightly lower at 39%. Bizarre. Just a bizarre set of numbers right there. Yeah, this seems like it's the type of movie where it would be uh, critics much lower. And I think you had said before, it's surprising that it's not 50% critics and like 90% audience because this movie okay. is made for the audience. Yeah, it should be 99% except for like your grandma who just can't handle it <laughs> but yet knows how to leave a review on Rotten Tomatoes. If you're watching a Van Damme movie in at this time, you know exactly what you're in for. And this gave you more than what you're expecting. Yeah. It's insane to me that, that that many people say they don't like this movie for whatever reason. It's impossible to bring this up. This was just a rewatchables on um, the Bill Simmons podcast, the rewatchables. Like this is a very rewatchable movie. So it's, crazy that it's so low in its score for the audience yeah i mean I, I had such a great time every single time watching it like you said that there's there's more you see every time you see it it's it's not just a awesome action film it's an awesome action film that has so many great details absolutely a uh, little bit of background some interesting things in the the production of the film so it came out in december 22nd 1995 opened number eight shocked that a film like this could open number eight took in 4.7 million its opening weekend waiting to exhale its opening weekend took uh came in number one that weekend that's a good movie <laughs> uh, took worldwide ended up 64 million so it, it had some longevity it had some legs it started at 4 million for the first week and made it up to 64 yeah, yeah it's definitely some legs so you got to figure especially in 1995 that's some strong word of mouth you have to assume yep Interesting thing. So Howard Baldwin is one of the producers, and he was also a part owner of the Penguins, which makes sense once you see the film, the, the extreme overlap with the, the, the hockey in the, in the it's, film. It, it's hard to believe that a franchise would let their team be associated with this type of movie these days, but I'm glad they did back in the 90s. Absolutely. I feel like it could only come together in one of these situations where you have an owner who's also a movie producer. Like that's the only scenario where this is. <laughs> 
ever going to happen. It's the perfect storm. It really is. So part owner, and he wanted the the hockey scenes to be re- as realistic as possible, which they end up doing a great job at. But it took a while to get there. So they had planned on using footage from the opening, the first game of the season, the Penguins Blackhawks game. But then the 1995 season had a hockey strike. So the opening game got delayed due to the strike to the extent that they the timing just wasn't going to work out. So they decided to try for an exhibition game between some of the Penguins players and their minor league affiliate. And, and they filmed the whole thing, but that the intensity just wasn't there that the producers wanted. So they were like, this isn't it. We got to keep trying at this. And they set up another game with the Johnstown Chiefs and the Wheeling Thunderbolts of the EHCL, which is a, a much lower tier pro league. And that did the trick. And I, I think it's, it is awesome. The, the intensity is there. They ended up getting two to 3,000 extras in the stadium to film all the scenes. And this is pre-CGI for the most part. So you'll see that it looks like thousands of people. They used cardboard cutouts to fill out the, the stands, which I knew that after having done some research. And it's all I've tried to find them. And it's they are the most realistic cardboard cutouts I've ever seen in my life. Like they put a uh, home. Like a to... Yeah, that looks like a pack stadium. You're right. Home oh, alone. Yeah. I would have owned the house with these these cardboard yeah. cutouts. <laughs> <laughs> also, just interesting tidbit. Uh, they had also offered the role to Schwarzenegger, Stallone, and Bruce Willis, all of them turning the role down for various reasons, and sort of settled with Jean-Claude Van Damme. And he's the perfect actor for this. I mean, I, I'm sure, I guess he wasn't their first choice, but he's definitely the best choice. That makes sense, because it's not your typical Van Damme movie. He's not, he rarely plays, like, he kind of plays more of a regular guy in this. Uh, oh, yeah. And oftentimes he's some sort of like, you know, com- competitive kickboxer uh, mm-hmm. in his movies, not just, you know, a firefighter. So that makes sense that they were going for other people. But also Bruce Willis couldn't have done Die Hard at a hockey stadium too, right? Right. Well, <laughs> and the funny part is that he couldn't do it because he was filming Die Hard with a Vengeance. <laughs> oh. Well, that movie's great. Yeah. Thankfully that this worked out perfectly because we get – that movie, which is fantastic, and this movie, which is fantastic. Uh, should we get into the bolos? I cannot wait. My list is way too long. Um, all right, let's go. Bolo, open eyes. Yeah, another eye movie, strangely enough, back-to-back. And another another back-to-back bolo here, Bolo the Solo Earring. Yep, oh, yep, I have that as well. Um, bolo... Shooting people with lots of bullets. Yeah, bullets were on sale in this movie. <laughs> I'm going to say this is, and this is really, I guess it's not a cookie, it's fruit and cake, but it's one of my favorite fruits and cakes. Bolo the Fig Newton. <laughs> uh, Bolo, Mrs. Roper. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'll say Bolo, a $15,000 wristwatch. Not $10,000. <laughs> Not 10,000. Bolo, an incredibly dangerous but very impressive knife trick. Knives in general, yeah. I will say Bolo, a surprising lighter. (laughs) Very. Uh, Bolo, this is nostalgic for me. I missed this. Bolo, ESPN's coverage of hockey. Oh yeah, I had that as well. The especially the just vintage ESPN graphics and the the, oh, the music so sound, everything is fantastic. I will just throw out there Bolo bodies got a lot of big body count in this film. Surprising amount of bodies in this movie. Bolo a moaning cow. <laughs> <laughs> I will say Bolo a zamboni. Oh yep. Bolo, not just headshots, but four headshots. Oh, yeah. Very, very well-placed headshots. <laughs> Professionals. Let me go with a... This is probably along the lines of a professional situation, but just a very casual bomb placing. Yeah. Just another day. If you're big into the hockey in the 90s, this movie's ridiculous with references to big-name players only within these two teams, so... You've got Yager, Luke Robitaille, Kevin Stevens, and more. 
You might be missing right. one main person from the Penguins team back in that time, though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's probably busy doing something else, I guess. I'm going to say Bolo a hand stamp, a, a very crucial hand stamp. Uh, Bolo the game Doom. I don't think it was Wolfenstein. I think it was Doom. Yeah, I couldn't tell. I will say Bolo a trap door. <laughs> Bolo covering your head. And I'll go Bolo a suitcase laptop. <laughs> um, Bolo crush red pepper flakes. and maybe along the same lines we'll see bolo a rocket launcher (laughs) bolo a glove save and i'll flip this bolo a really soft goal so it is yeah situation it's just a really soft goal you see hate to see it bolo if you ever watched justified uh raylan givens his dad Ooh, nice pull I will go Bolo a just exceptionally fast jersey change. <laughs> so jersey and equipment. Yes. <laughs> Bolo, and this happens a lot. It doesn't happen for much of the movie until like a one minute area where this it's said like three or four different times, but Bolo, the title line of the movie, it's everywhere once they say it the first time. It is. It's uh once they start, they can't stop. I'm going to go, this is this will be my last one. I'm just going to say Bolo, two burning men. <laughs> All right, my last one here. Bolo, grip strength. Lots of very good grip strength in this movie. Absolutely. Strength, strength all around, but especially strength. grip strength. Uh, yeah, that's like half of my list, so we'll, we'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what do you got for a uh, drink to pair with the film? This is, you know one of the ones that sort of comes from the movie. I wasn't quite sure. I started off, I had written down that this would be good to enjoy like you're at a hockey game where you have like mm-hmm. big oversized like Coors Light or Bud Light, maybe one of those 20 ounce cans and you pour it into one, a plastic cup in your home and you're like, it's, this movie is like right. you're watching a hockey game. But I settled on just a nice young red wine. Hmm. I like that. Any kind you want, like, as long as it's a little feisty. <laughs> <laughs> I went with your your first instinct there, and I think I may have chosen this for Last Action Hero as well. Uh, but I'm just going to say, get yourself a, a fountain soda. So not from a can, but in a, in a in a cardboard cup, and get yourself fountain soda and throw your favorite mixer in there, and just sit back on the couch and enjoy. It's definitely that kind of movie. What uh, this, like most of our movies, this does feel like a five o'clock or on a Friday as well. If you want to pick a time yeah. for it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This is this is the kind of movie that you don't need to think too much about it. You can just you've you've had a long week. Give yourself give yourself the night off and just watch this movie with a big gulp full of whatever you've earned. <laughs> you've earned it. All right, uh, won't late waste uh any more of your time so you get a chance to go watch the movie but uh enjoy this is a fun one enjoy as we get ready for the seventh and final game of the stanley cup finals you can feel the electricity in the air and there's no question it just sends a chill up your spine paul that's a fact mike and to make things even more exciting the vice president of the united states is here this evening don't leave your seats 911 emergency services i'm calling you from the civic arena the vice president is being held hostage in the owner's box. And they've got my daughter, too. What is your objective? One billion seven hundred million dollars. Tonight, 17,000 hockey fans have been taken hostage. Enough bombs have been planted in this building to stop all the clocks in the hemisphere. But only one of them knows it. I'm going to try to stop you. I know where the bombs are, so I know where you're going. Then come and get me. <laughs> Now he has more to lose than anyone. Jean-Claude Van Damme. Powers boost. Sudden death.
Slept on Cinema is brought to you by Training Ties, the ultimate shoe tying tool. If you know anyone who's struggling with shoe tying, Training Ties is the perfect solution. Or if you know anyone who just doesn't like tying their shoes, Training Ties keeps shoes tied all day long. Say no to Velcro and yes to independence with Training Ties. Welcome back. Wow. I said at the beginning that that movie kicks ass. And you know, I watched it a number of times to prepare for this. And every single time I was just glued to the screen. I, this is another movie where I had I had to watch it like three or four times because I just wasn't taking good enough notes. I just kept getting pulled into the movie. But I have a question. If the score was different, could this have been a horror movie instead of an action movie? Because there are some horrific and just callous deaths in this movie that are terrifying if the yeah, music was is, a little different. Yes, this is... Um one of the most brutal movies that we've ever discussed on this show and, and, and so casually brutal too. Uh, maybe, I mean, I, I feel like the, the degree of violence that is in this in such a offhanded way is something that just doesn't exist in movies. Now, like movies now are much more stylized or intentional about it. This was just casual. This was just sure. I'll shoot another person in the forehead or like, I'll just blow someone away for no reason. I'll make some more orphans by killing this guy. Whatever. Yeah, right. So absolutely. I mean, I think it it borders on horror, certainly, at times as it is. And (laughs) certainly if the music puts you more in that scene, I think you're experiencing this in a totally different way. Yeah, spiders? I don't want spiders in a little kid's mouth. I I hope he ad-libbed that because that was just bonkers. Bonkers, yeah. <laughs> she was already terrified enough, and then like, oh, spiders in your mouth. How would that feel? <laughs> like, can you imagine? Right, saying, obviously, there's almost everything in this movie. Like, of course, nobody would ever do that. But like, can you imagine saying that to a small child? <laughs> that was after they had given her multiple death threats to the small child. Yes. Like, haha, I'm gonna buy your mother's day card. Or what you do is you shoot her. <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah. Everyone just want these girls just hearing all these bad guys talking about how. They should just shoot her. Vicious. Uh, yeah, like you said, this is kind of like last action hero for us where it's just so many things to draft, but I'm very intrigued to see what your first pick is. Yeah, I have... I I feel like sometimes I, I have a lot of down-the-road picks. Like Sometimes I'm like, man, I have like 15 sleepers, but maybe not a first clear one. Here I have eight clear number one picks. Like any <laughs> any number of my picks could go number one, so I I know the outcome of this draft is going to be fantastic because I'm going to get you're gonna, all number one picks. Yeah, um, you get at least half of your, your, yeah, all of your yes. picks will be number one picks. Yes, <laughs> uh, I got an all star team coming up, but the first overall, this just stuck with me. You might think this is a ridiculous pick to take, but I'm taking the title. I think <laughs> sudden death. I'm going to say it's the greatest title of all time for any movie in the history of movies. It's it's in your face. It ties to hockey. It ties to the feeling you have in the film. It ties to the fact that these bombs could go off at any minute and kill everybody. It ties to just the immediacy of everything. It ties to the era. It makes me think of Jean-Claude Van Damme because he could always kill you instantly. It's like... Whoever came up with this title, that has to be the pinnacle of their existence because it's the perfect title. It's absolutely perfect. I'm not sure there's ever... I didn't see that coming as uh, the first pick, but now you've made it so obvious where it's the clear-cut first pick. The title is incredible, and they used it a ton, and it's also, like you said, it's it's a time... It's, uh, it's a, a a nod to like the era to the point where we can like there was so much violence in this movie that was completely unnecessary. Where if this movie came out today, there'd be so many people upset with it. Never mind the title. The title they had to change "Sudden Death" to be "Golden Goal" because <laughs> it's so terrifying that suddenly you're talking about sudden death in sports. But this movie didn't care. Oh, yeah. Sudden death is everywhere around you in, in this movie, and especially around Jean Claude Van Damme. Yeah, I mean, if you went to see this and it was called Golden Goal, that's false. <laughs> like, you, yeah. this is a movie that needs to be called Sudden Death. That's it. That's an incredible first pick. And I thought 
I was sneaking this through, but I didn't. That was the number one pick. I'm gonna just gonna go just like did the last movie. I'm taking Van Damme. Oh yeah. I know you said in the beginning he was passed over. I mean, um, they thought about having Bruce Willis and Schwarzenegger and Stallone. They all would have been very, very different movies. And this is so I think this is Van Damme's best acting job ever. Now, I know at this point this may have been like the height of his uh cocaine problem or whatever, but whatever was happening didn't matter. This Jean Claude crush it. He'd never I don't ever remember him playing a regular guy before. He's just he's a firefighter. He's usually just like this kickbox you know, Hank Dukes, he's he's usually like a kickboxing guy and it's very clear where his backstory is or he's playing uh what is he M Bison in the you know, Street Fighter. He's 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 always a guy that knows uh how to kill people with his body. And in this he's just like a guy, a regular guy who's divorced and a firefighter and he pulls it off. Yeah, he 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 did an excellent job, and I and I wondered if part of it was that he was sort of just playing. It was almost like he was playing a regular guy who was having to play hero. So in a way, it was like playing a guy who was acting. And I know he gets ripped on for his acting skills, but maybe here, where he's playing a guy who's having to, you know, is thrust into this other situation, having to like step up and be somebody else for this period of time. Maybe that just worked with him. You know, it's like he's like, all right, I'm playing a guy who's for right now playing a guy it absolutely worked because I, I was blown away by his uh his acting in this movie and i probably should have picked this first but i just wanted to give van damme his credit his due um but the kitchen fight scene versus icy oh man yes that was that was next on my list it has to like i can't believe i i, I just wanted to give van damme his, his due but like really my in my heart my second pick is my first pick, but that's because of Van Damme. But that that fight with, you know, it's the it's a woman in there underneath, and uh, <laughs> just like every time Van Damme punches the mascot in the head, <laughs> it's a giggle <laughs> every single time. And yeah. Especially after the uh, the half the head was taken off by the fan, and it's walking around with half its head. <laughs> it's it's uh, amazing. The- the number of just things that get used in the fight scenes. I, I wrote down, I'm sure this isn't all of them. A cleaver, a slicer, a fryer, a fan, a freezer, a dishwasher, a bone, and then pepper. And I'm sure there's others, but they made use of everything. Yeah, uh, the, he's very in control of his surroundings. He's Absolutely. very aware, just like a ninja, can always kill you eight ways with anything that's in a room. He uses everything in that kitchen. And they went back to it. They had a kitchen scene. And then the guy's like, take me back. And yes. I'm the entire time. It's like, yes. Why wouldn't I want to go back to the kitchen for another scene? What else can he pull out? And he pulls out a chicken bone. Yes. I mean, it's it's amazing. We talked about this before, how this movie gives you everything and then gives you a little bit more. And this is the perfect example of that, where it's you have this awesome, never-ending fight scene in the kitchen goes through this whole thing and then you're like wow that was the most amazing action scene i've seen in a very long time and then they just go back and give it to you some more with some different different elements it's like yes they 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 knew exactly what we wanted and they just hit us over the head with it until we couldn't take it anymore like there's there was a chicken in there and i think some dried ice we didn't use in the last fight scene so we we got to use those things let's get back yeah. in there it uh, that's i I had I was toying between for my first overall between uh, the title and the kitchen scenes and the, uh, just obvious obvious all around number one pick so far. I am gonna take. I got so many good choices. I feel like I ha- I feel like I have to take Jean Claude Van Damme playing goalie scene, and <laughs> if, uh, I think obviously that is the scene. That is the most memorable. That's a scene that gets talked about. If you mention sudden death to the casual movie fan, they're to say, isn't that the one where Jean-Claude Van Damme plays goalie in game seven of the Stanley Cup? And you're like, yep, that's it. And it's an amazing scene. You've got so many things going on with it. And it's also just, just like the second kitchen scene, it's totally unnecessary for basically any reason. But <laughs> it's also amazing. So it's like, I'm so glad they gave this to us. They didn't have to. 
this was again the move the the people making this movie saying we know we could give you a a, a simpler film that doesn't have all these bells and whistles but we know what you want and we're going to give it to you and that's what this hockey scene is totally unnecessary but i'm just love that it exists and it's also a sign another like glimpse into the era of hockey in 95 goalies used to stack their pads like that flip on their sides and throw the glove up that was a way that they played now it's the butterfly and everyone stands upright but you don't see this very much when you watch hockey now but in 1995 this was the play you stack the pads and you you throw that glove on top of your pads and he knew that he knew the thing he played his and they they added that of course little my daddy played minor league hockey before just so you know that like it's not just some schmuck you played some minor league hockey in Canada. You probably have some idea of how to play hockey. Oh yeah, I mean, I feel like minor league hockey in Canada—that's already you're in like the point oh one percentile, like the the top of the top, just of all of all hockey players in the world at that point. Oh, absolutely. That's a great choice. So had to take that. Had to make sure that got on there. My third pick. I'm going with the announcers. The <laughs> Penguins announcers, and these were the real Penguins announcers at the time, which is also just a fantastic detail. Uh, but the lines that they have throughout the film, e- every time they're on the screen, like I could just watch a whole show uh, of these guys. I probably should have been, I guess, watching more Penguins hockey in the, in the mid-1990s. But their lines and how they tie into the film, or like early on in the film when they're talking about how crowded it is, how hard it, how hard it was to get a ticket, I don't care if you're packing heat. You couldn't get in here. Great line for this. Another one later on. This place is ready to explode. <laughs> we'll just nail it. And then just for fun, I'm not even sure why they said this. Scratch my back with a hacksaw. Yeah, great. That's just so, like, I think but, it's just hockey target. guys. Yeah. It's a hockey guy thing to say. <laughs> I also I like think- uh, the the way they treat um concussions so like meh it's no big there was no oh, concussions yeah. you just got your head your bell rung and he goes uh the, the announcer said he got hit so hard his kids will be born dizzy and then they laugh yeah. about it yep <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's got permanent mental damage <laughs> yeah different a different time and a perfect time capsule of that time is these two announcers those guys were incredible uh, they like they kept it straight, but they also were like you know the announcers in basketball almost like they were teetering that line, oh, of yeah. being overtly ridiculous and then like also paying attention to the game. Oh, my pick! Uh, <clears throat> this was probably in my heart my first pick, but I thought I could get it late, so I just didn't say anything. <laughs> um, I'm taking the direct. I'm taking the director, Peter Heim. Nice, nice. Our, our second goal. Our this is our third high end movie. It's our third. Oh wow! This is our third high end movie. So he has directed Time Cop, this, and The Relic. Oh, The Didn't Relic. Have Van Damme. The Relic. All three were in a row, and after that is a movie that I loved with Arnold, End of Days, which is on our oh, list. Yeah. That's a good movie. Like. This guy knows what we want, and every one of the reviews that were negative just made fun of him for just being a terrible director and like ruining movies. But he makes a really fun movie. They also complain that he's too sadistic and all that stuff. But like, it, I don't see this movie as sadistic. It's just like an action movie with no sense of right. Like, it doesn't care what's right or wrong. These are just bad guys. There's no level to the bad guys. There's no. There's no moral compass. Movie. Yeah, no these more compass. These are just bad. bad guys, like in a video game. Bad guys. And that's great. I'll, I'll move against the bad guy. Right. It's a very black and white film. There's good guys and bad guys. There's no nope. moral ambiguity here. And I'm just, uh, I think we we have, he's our favorite director so far. We have not had any other director three times on this podcast. Yeah. Wow. Totally forgot about the relic, <laughs> but. Amazing, amazing. Just th- that three films alone is an amazing career right there. Oh, now it's a uh, sleeper pick, right? Yeah, what you got? There's so many different directions to go. 
I think I'm taking the ex-wife's place where they're playing street hockey with that view. <laughs> Looking Amazing over view. the city. Oh, my gosh. They was such a great street. And they just just a low key like, oh, yeah, this is the best view in all of Pittsburgh. No big deal. Yeah, that's a great so, pick. And it, it's so it's so casual. It's so 90s, too. Of just, I feel like that was an era where everyone's houses were kind of the same. Like, like mm-hmm. there, I feel like now there's like giant mansions and like tiny houses. I feel like this was just an era where you just had houses. And that was a perfect one. And it just had a perfect view. Yep. Like, it looked like a house that maybe I could have lived in, but definitely could not have because it was way more expensive. But yeah, just <laughs> look at a house with an amazing, amazing view. That's a great pick. For my sleeper pick, so I, I, I have a friend who's also very into movies, and he, one of his main gripes in almost every action movie that has a helicopter scene is that there are always all these people shooting guns at helicopters, and they never seem to do any real damage. Like the helicopter's <laughs> been taken, and that's his, he hates that. And this is the exact opposite. This has the best shooting the most accurate shooting into a helicopter I've ever seen. So you get Van Damme firing two direct shots through the belly of the helicopter into the, the two guys piloting it off of the dome, the roof of the dome. And then you get the helicopter falling exactly <laughs> perpendicularly, perfectly straight down directly into the opening in the dome and then exploding down on the ice. And I thought everything about that scene was absolutely perfect including the eye contact right before he went down yes everything was uh, i just, uh, especially how perpendicular the helicopter was when it went into it the dome so straight so- it could <laughs> be more straight it was it was it's amazing to see i watched that a number of times i just i, I loved it yeah the helicopters were like paper mache in this and usually they're just tanks if anyone's yeah. shooting a helicopter, right. it's just like, oh yeah, it, it's just sitting a duck. It's a sitting duck, no big deal. Yep. I don't have an anti pick, but this I almost picked this because it reminded me of uh, Austin Powers and Will Ferrell. But I almost picked uh, the asking a villain three times before they give up the answer. So like when Van Damme got that uh, security guard in the uh, the kitchen the second time and he's pressing his ear on the dried ice, he has to do it three <laughs> times. Before the guy's like, okay, okay, I'll tell you everything. It just was like, reminded me exactly of the Will Ferrell. Like, if, I just get really annoyed if you ask me three times and I'll tell you everything you want. Yep. <laughs> I also loved right before that, I guess this is just a bonus pick for me, right before that, where that same guy, they're talking about talking about what's going on. And he mentions Jean-Claude Van Damme's daughter's name. And it's, you know, we oh, talked yeah. about this goes all the way back to the net our first episode we talk about one of the things that we love is when someone reveals that detail that they weren't supposed to and here they they play on that so well we're right after he says it he's like oh i'm always doing that <laughs> you didn't say your name did you and it's like it's one of the best ways i've ever seen that done in any movie because of how they they toy with the audience a little bit uh knowing it's a trope it's so self-aware and the guy is so confident that he's going to kill this guy where he didn't care if he outed himself, didn't care at all. And then he realized when that once that bone was in his neck that he just did that to the wrong person. As he said, he wasn't a terrorist. He was a professional. Professional. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Our, our superlative this week, and we've touched on this a bit in our commentary so far, but this is a vicious movie right off the bat. And what other way to recognize that than for the superlative to be the most vicious act in the film? Yeah, this is, a, this is really hard. There's a lot to choose from. There, there is. Um, all right, I'll go first. I'm, I'm not choosing this. I'm going to say it because I don't think you are either. This isn't. It's not vicious, but it's it's kind of funny vicious. Where after Van Dam made the save, I'm not I'm not picking this. Uh, after <laughs> Van Dam made the save, and he gave the the sign language "I love you" to his son, he just skated up to the other team, the guy, and just like pulled him around and just just knocked him out. <laughs> like oh, it yeah. was no big deal. It's completely fine. Like I I know you have no idea what's going on, but I'm just gonna break your jaw and no big deal. Yep. Yep, that's a that's a thousand dollar fine right there. 
It's a vicious act, but it's uh, not that vicious. So I'm not picking that. I just thought it was funny. I think the killing of the wife of the chef and the chef was just the most vicious. It just seemed mm -hmm. he didn't need to really do that. And the guy who was visiting Mrs. Roper, the, who was the, the wife of the chef, was just a jerk to her the whole time. It was unnecessary. I feel like you didn't you put on a mask. You could, you could have got away with that scenario without killing her very, easily. very easily. And you, she just gave you Fig Newtons, the world, yeah. one of the great foods on the on the planet Earth, and then you kill her. Yeah, it's that, obnoxious. That is stone cold. But that that yeah. was that happened early enough where you knew where this like anyone could go. So that way, once once they went, like every time they pointed the gun at the kid, you're like, well, they might kill the kid. Oh yeah, yeah. Every single time, and that that's a great pick. That was that was on my list. I was toying with with taking that. I, as well, and, and her husband, just because the, the way both of them went was so vicious, so unnecessary, so ca so casually vicious. I also toyed with shooting the security guards right in the beginning of the of the film because they not only also didn't have to really do that; they could have tied them up as any other number of things. But oh, it was right wait, after wait, they the told. Guys the lost, sorry, the guys with the lost dog. Uh, this was the guys who they rear end. With the yeah, fake, yeah, and uh, like, oh, I was looking for my dog, and then yes, they exactly. pump him full of like a hundred bullets. Yes, right, right <laughs> after telling them like, you, you don't want to get killed over this, play nice here, and then they do, and then they just blow them away. They yeah. riddle them with bullets, and they that, gave him a that, closed, that... they gave him a closed casket wedding. I mean, a closed casket funeral. <laughs> yes, <laughs> from how yeah. you might have bullet. All right, so that's not the pick. So I'm not going with that, but I'm just going within the elevator scene with the mascot when the mascot <laughs> actually attempts to shoot the little girl. And I know it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not an actual killing, but Oh my God, they were just about to shoot this little girl in an elevator. Yeah. I, they, I can't they, think of anything more vicious than shooting a little, a little girl. That I, that fake icy was just awful. And Oh, you're going to have to buy me a mother's day card. Like, <laughs> Jesus, no, you just want to get more bullets to shoot her. Yeah. I I was just like, whoa, they really just did that. These people are they're not they're not messing around. And that's what I mean. Like this movie could skew horror because it yep. is not like a line for these villains. They'll just kill anyone, including yeah. a little girl for basically no reason. Yep. Um all right, what do you got? Was this a blockbuster? Did it, how much did it? I forget the budget in the. Um, really, I, don't, I couldn't. I couldn't find good budget numbers, but I'm. There's no way it cost. Well, I don't know. I'm, yeah, it was a blockbuster. I know. Yeah, blockbuster. Yeah. So one change to be a blockbuster, uh, even though it already was one. What do you got? I I struggled with this really hard, and and I. I I want to say. I mean, I watched it. And of course, this is a thing we say a lot. You know, I, I think it it should have been a little shorter. And it wasn't long. It was like an hour 50. I think if this is an hour 35, hour 40, that's probably the sweet spot for a movie like this. But there's a big but here. I went through all the scenes and there's nowhere to trim. You know, like the, the only obvious place where you could trim out a big chunk is the hockey scene. But you cannot trim out the hockey. Like the hockey scene has, you could take that out and the entire movie would be exactly the same. It really has basically nothing to do with the. It doesn't really advance anything. But that's also one of the greatest scenes in the history of action films. So, again, that was the scene where they, they, they knew we wanted it. They gave it to us. So I can't take that away. This movie, this movie is nowhere near as good without that scene. So I, I, I want it to be shorter, but I don't want to miss anything. It's like I, I want my... I want, I want my Fig Newton and eat it too. Eat it and too, I, yeah. I can't. Well, the answer is definitely not cut that scene because like you said before, when you reference the scene, everyone goes, oh, the one where John claude made the save? Yeah, so you can't cut that out. Uh, but it was about 40 minutes, I think is what I, I paused it and looked at, where before Jean claude was involved in what was going on and started like mm -hmm. getting back. So it took a, like... The intro was incredibly quick. You knew his backstory. There was no text needed. That first scene I thought you might have liked because you knew exactly where we were. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the first scene. Um, but then after that, it just like just dragged 
for about 40 minutes until we got That's to true. the like Jean-Claude can actually knows what's going on. They have his kids and there's a bomb and he gets really into it and it goes into die hard mode, but it takes a while to get there. That's a good point. Yeah. It, it, I guess we didn't need to see Jean-Claude introducing himself to every or, or saying hi to everyone who <laughs> seemed to know him. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you weren't, uh, you didn't enjoy that light bulb changing scene in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I have one change, one change. That's it. And this will make it a blockbuster. Let's see if you agree. Sure. Instead of Powers Booth, who did a very good job, you did a good job. I'm, at this time, I'm going Gary Oldman as the as the villain. Oh. If Gary Oldman, yes. I mean, this is a blockbuster if we put yes. him in that position. That's, that's a great call. I think, yeah, he, he, brings, he brings a different energy to it. Yep. And I think a little bit more sort of like crazed, but in control still. Yeah. Crazed in control, very menacing. Powers Booth was like smarmy and yes. casual and he had that down. But it wasn't this just like menacing rage behind his face. It, it's just kind of like, yeah, yeah. You don't even know why he was doing it. Right. I feel like Powers but, Booth yeah. pulled off, would, would be able to pull off the $15,000 wristwatch line better than Gary Oldman could, yeah. but Gary Oldman would be able to do everything else on a higher yeah. level. Absolutely. So I do believe if they switch that and Gary Oldman's in there, we're talking, this doesn't make our podcast. Oh, no chance. No yeah, chance. One this, chance. Is, this is, you know, in the pantheon. Um, also maybe, uh, maybe some more one-liners. They could have had a little more fun with this. Like, after Van Damme throws someone through the dishwasher or something like, ah, you cook or you clean or there's something, uh, ah, sorry, I'm such a big pain in your neck or something after the chicken wing goes in the guy's neck. There could be some more of that. Usually just, he's, they usually just show him watching and being like, ah, oh, I didn't mean to do that, but I had to do that. Yeah, I like that a lot too. And and it's kind of surprising, but maybe that's just the direction they wanted to go. Yeah. All right, next uh, spinoff ideas. What do you got? So this is, um, you know, I'm really taking, stretching the limits of spinoff here. We talked about this when we did Passenger 57, how that also was a diehard ripoff. And a lot of the reviews on this were like, oh, it's a diehard ripoff. And we, and we talked about this. I won't get into it now about how we were sort of like, give us all the diehard ripoffs. Like, why not? So I'm not going to get too far into it, but I am going to say that that's my spinoff of just, Give me some more Die Hard spinoffs. <laughs> it's it's been long enough, and I I just I, I thought about this for a little while. These were the top three that I came up with, so it doesn't have to be related to this movie in any way. But here, just give me these three uh, Die Hard ripoffs. And I'm curious if you have any of of your own. One Die Hard in a zoo. I'd like to see that with all the animals. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Is that two, like Beverly Hills Cop three? Yeah, Boy, that was in a zoo. In elements, uh, a racer also has some zoo scenes, but I want the whole thing taking place in a zoo. Love that. That's great. Yep. Die Hard in Space feels like an obvious one. That is obvious. Kind of yeah. Blown away. And then just a fun wrinkle uh, Die Hard in a convent. <laughs> Why not? The Nun, the nun 3. Right. The Nun, but uh, action movie version. Action movie version. I think. Um... We, we we had Sister Act. I I think we could have Die Hard with Nuts. I got to say, I, if any of this came out, like a movie came out like a year, and it's like, this is like Die Hard in a zoo or space or in a convent, I don't know how I'm not, we're not going to that movie. Well, that's an opening, I, that's an opening movie. It became something that I think movies were afraid to be. Like, oh no, this is another Die Hard movie. When it should be, a, it, it's not a scarlet letter. This isn't an A for... That this is a varsity letter. You should be proud yes. of wearing yes. that letter. That you are like a diehard. <laughs> it's also been it's been long enough. I feel like we we went through a run of these, and people then we went through a lull because people I don't know got burned out on them. But it's been long enough. Let's let's bring them all back. Ah, uh, that's a great one. Uh, well, 
or follow that up with. I want, yeah. I want the prequel. Like it's clear he's not just an arson investigator, and his past isn't just like finding where fire started. Oh yeah, there is a him building that dark gun. Yeah, him building that dark gun, gun, and like using heavy machinery with pipes and PVC, and like creating all this. There's some deep stuff going on there. So I want the prequel, and my idea for the prequel is that he was like john wick style guy who you know worked for whatever agency to save people in his last assignment he killed everyone he possibly could to save the child that he needed to save and the child died and he just he just he had enough of this life he's like i'm gonna not kill i'm gonna just protect and he joined the he was a firefighter he moved away from his crazy european life and came to pittsburgh of all places and just became a firefighter regular guy um, and on the job, he unfortunately is the cause of another child dying and he just couldn't handle it. But before it gets there, I want to see that like John Wicky life of oh, yeah. Jim Jam, who clearly can handle himself. Oh, yeah. I would love to see that. And and maybe we can find another Jean-Claude Van Damme movie that we could just convince ourselves is that people. <laughs> I love doing that with movies. You're like, oh, that could be the prequel of this. Yeah. No way to run was like this. And then uh, it just a couple years went by. Or Time Cop. You could just be a different guy now. Right. Right. <laughs> um, all right. Any notes we didn't get to? I'll say this. This is the most difficult opening scene in short, like the shortest and most difficult opening scene we've done. Yes, I mean, I can't recall another opening scene where a small child dies tragically that is really unrelated to the plot of the film. It's obviously important for the character, but unrelated to the plot in any way. And they just kill this little girl. I didn't see it coming. The first time I saw it, I was like, oh. (laughs) My mother-in-law is visiting us, and I know she doesn't like these movies, but uh, she walked by and saw that opening scene and was like, is that a doll? Why is he? And I was like, no, that's a dead child that it, I know yeah. the eyes are open. And it looks horrible. Uh, let's see. Oh, uh, as a child of divorce, the dad coming over with the tickets that night is a jerk. Mm-hmm. Move. No phone <laughs> call that the mom and the uh, stepdad have been planning this dinner out to Sizzler or, or Outback Steakhouse, wherever they're going. And it was a big deal until it got blown out of the water with this guy showing up at six o'clock at night being like, Hey, want to go to the big game? Yeah, I also, following up that same scene, the, the stepdad's comment is like, oh, the vice president's going to be there. <laughs> and like, so? <laughs> like, who, yeah. like, who cares? Especially these little kids. Like, oh, the it's not even the president. Wow. Yeah, it, and even if it was the president, I'd be like, yeah, it's game seven of the Stanley Cup. I don't game seven. Care this is everybody. Pittsburgh. I don't care about <laughs> politics right now. Yeah, especially the vice president. Like, I don't even know what the vice president does. The vice president came to my college once, and I was like, man, I don't need to go see that. That's not that big a deal. Right. It's like, okay. All right. Yeah. Who are you? Who is this? Yeah. All right. You got anything? I think I hit most of my things. All right. I can speed. I can go speed round through some of mine if you, if Let's you hear don't it. have any. Uh, is is John Cla- Claude sleeping with Joan the I- or Icy? Have they had some relations? Yes. I I, it, I think yes, because it didn't seem like he'd been working there that long, yet they no. seem to have a pretty strong connection. Yes. More so than almost anybody else there. Okay, so we'll go with the yes there. Uh, so we grew up in Boston. I grew up going to the Boston Garden. Did you ever go and get left in your seats when you were a kid? Because uh... I thought that was you. Not that I recall. I don't think I. I don't think my parents would have left me in the seat there. They would have been like, wherever they're going, I had to go with them. Oh well, there was a. You couldn't smoke in your seats for a while at the garden in the mid nineties. So <laughs> there was like a smoking section. So my dad would go out and smoke, and then you just sit in the seat, and you just like you like you're like ah, those people around you. Can you watch my son? He's five. Whatever. Yeah. He'll be fine. Just don't let him leave. And it was fine, but in this movie, it seems like so crazy. Just be like, "Hey, have your kids watch the game all by themselves the entire time." I feel like these days that would never happen. Yeah, and you also get that ridiculous line from the kid at the end. 
I didn't move, Dad. I didn't move. Not even when things blew up. <laughs> like, kid, you no. probably should have moved when things blew up. <laughs> I wasn't being literal before. <laughs> All right, a couple more. Uh, we've this quote from the Secret Service guy. Uh, we've messed up a few times since I've been an agent, but how the f did we lose the vice president? That's so funny. Like, ah. I know we mess up all the time, guys, but this is yeah. this is a <laughs> this is a bad one. <laughs> when fake IC was with the little girl, they were trying to get up to the, the the owner's box, and they were explaining, "Hey, I'm the mascot." And the guy's like, "Okay, oh, you are the ma-. she's there in the icy mascot oh, yeah. uniform." She has to say, "Hey, I'm the mascot." Being dressed as the mascot wasn't enough to be like, "I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm not the impersonator of the mascot." I am the mascot. <laughs> uh, I found it funny that Tolliver had no medical support. The uh, the original goalie who was had a temperature oh, yeah. for when they went into the, the the equipment room, he's just there on his back with the oxygen mask and no one else around. Yeah, well, it's game seven. It's like if he if he keels over or whatever, it's the end of the season. Yeah, he'll get some rest in the off season. That's all I got. Yeah. <laughs> well, that movie that was so much fun. And I, I think experiencing this movie has told us what we're doing. I guess it's probably not our next one. So we'll have a special episode coming up next, but our next regular episode, we just couldn't get enough Jean Claude Van Damme. We got to dip back into the well. I think sometimes we just hit a nerve with like movies that resonate with us and actors that resonate with us. And it's, we hit it and we're just like, can we do more of this? So it's like Jean Claude, Time Cop wasn't enough. This wasn't enough. We need. One more in Universal yeah, Soldier. More. We get Dolph Lundgren and Jean Claude Van Damme. I mean, outside of creature features, this is our wheelhouse. Yeah, it's I it's I can't wait to see this again. It's just going to be fantastic. Yep. So uh, upcoming is Universal Soldier. Can't wait. This was a blast. And uh, later. Yeah, later. <laughs> <laughs>